Jesus calls the official 12. What's going to happen now? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 10. All right, so this is exciting news. Jesus calls his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He could, they could cast them out. They can heal every disease and every affliction. So he gave them the power to do what he does. That's exciting news. I'm sure they were blown away about this. I mean, now they can do all the amazing things that Jesus was doing. Wow. And Jesus names them. Of course, we know them. And whenever they're mentioned in the Bible, they're always in this three sets of four. And it's always in this order. Peter, Andrew, James, John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, Philip, Bartholomew, also Nathaniel, Thomas, Matthew, then James, son of Alphaeus, this different guy, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. And here we get our ominous words from Matthew, who betrayed him. Wow. So we are laying it out there that this is about to happen. Most of the names we had seen being called where Jesus walked up to them and said, follow me. You know, it kind of struck me that Jesus only says, follow me, when he knows what the answer is going to be, yes. When he knows he's going to get an answer that's different, we see him ask that key question. We'll see him do that more. The Son of Man has no home, hinting that you won't have a home if you follow me. Or you say you have to bury your dead. Again, we don't know if it's true or not, but you're putting me off. You're delaying this for whatever reason. Jesus always knows how to ask that question. And we haven't seen many of these other ones being called. Matthew was the last one we saw officially called. But we'll hear more in other books about all these apostles. And we learn that apostle means disciple. It means messenger. But it also, in this case, is sent ones. These are people that Jesus sent. And it was very common in those times that you would have a rabbi. The rabbi would have students. The students would learn, question. It was a big debate, you know, going on back and forth between a rabbi and a student. Well, when is the sundown? That's when we see three stars in the sky. What should we do at Sabbath? I mean, the Talmud and the Mishnah and all that relays a debate between a rabbi and his followers. But in this case, we've done something a step more. Jesus had his disciples. They followed him. They helped him out. They traveled with him. Now he has given them power and he is sending them. The other interesting thing that people will point out is there's 12. Is that like the 12 tribes of Israel? Someone indicated that it's a good number to have. You don't get so many people that there's arguments and, and subgroups forming inside of them. The other interesting thing, and we'll learn more, like I said, about the apostles later, but Judas Iscariot. What does Iscariot mean? It's two big themes. One is there's a town of Kerioth, which means that he would be from that town. Or the other one is that the word itself it has something to do with like knife bearer assassin or even traitor. So we're not sure why he was called that, but he was. And so, oh boy. All right. So now the next part is Jesus sends him out. He says, first of all, don't go to the Gentiles, not the Samaritans, but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Makes me think that just a chapter ago, Jesus was talking about the lost sheep and how they were shepherdless and helpless and needed help. Are these the same sheep? Because now he's saying the lost sheep of Israel. Obviously, there's a lot of lost sheep in the world, but we're going to focus on Israel first. First of all, there are many people, and we've seen them in the apostles, who had that promise of Messiah for all these years. For 1,500 years, we've been thinking someone was going to save mankind from that fall in Eden, wanting the Messiah, the Savior, the person who will come and save. The prophets prophesied about him. People waited for Elijah to come and indicate him, to indicate when the Messiah, who the Messiah is. And we see that they were faithful in Israel, but they were also under the thumb of the leadership. The Sadducees, who were elites, who ran the temple structure, didn't believe in anything more than just the law, and made some pretty nice deals for themselves with first the Greeks and then the Romans. 
Then we have the Pharisees who tried, I think, to do what they thought God wanted, but they went overboard and started making rules on top of rules. And then they only saw their own way. Of course I'm right. I'm studied. I know this stuff. And then the scribes, which are going to be like teachers, the people who are well-versed in what was going on. I always thought about it in the sense of if you told your 16-year-old child, hey, on your birthday, I'm going to buy you a mode of transportation, they're going to look for a car. And when they see something else that's not a car in the driveway, they're going to be disappointed. And I think that is where the scribes felt. There were a lot of visions, even among my cousins and my grandmother, about what the Messiah is or was going to be. And people thought it had to do with politics. This was going to be a king like David who would bring us back together and throw all these foreigners out. Or this would be a guy who would make us follow all the rules and all the sub rules, and we will live the way we've decided we should live. I think that out of all these years, they just got a little off all the time. And, you know, if you ever go hiking and you just get 1% off your trail, after a very short period of time, you're way off the trail, even if you just diverted in a small angle. And I think that's what has, has happened all this time. And so now Jesus is bringing it back to the way it should be. And he is sending his apostles out first to the lost tribes of Israel. Bring them back. These are his people. Israel was his, his kingdom. And even though it's going out to everybody in the world, let's go talk to them first. Tells them they don't need anything. Probably they'd get robbed or mugged or it would be taken when they got thrown in jail. But just bring your clothes. It says two tunics, which means like you're going to bring a set of clothes and a backup set of clothes. And so you'll just wear that. If you've gone backpacking, you know, the idea is you wash one while you're wearing the other and, it, you know, it's minimal. And then you're going to have sandals because you need to walk and then a staff because obviously staffs are pretty handy. If you've never walked with hiking sticks, I highly recommend it. But staffs are very good. And then it says that a laborer deserves his food. So remember, we talked about how the harvest was ready and we needed laborers. And suddenly we see who the laborers are. Hey, Matthew, John, James, go, go home and pray for the laborers of the harvest and see if we can't get some. And guess what? We found some. They're these guys. And they're going to start to go out. They're these guys, but they're also us too. But they're saying, if you are the laborers, you deserve to be fed. So you're not bringing a lot of things. You're not bringing money with you. You will go and people will feed you. People will have you in their homes. And if for whatever reason they don't listen to you, this is a big one, shake the dust off your feet and leave that home or that town. He even invokes Sodom and Gomorrah that says, if people treat you poorly, if they don't listen to you, it's, it would be more bearable to be in Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be whatever town that is. That's pretty serious. But Jesus is trying to bring people back into the fold. And as these towns who were educated in the Messiah who was going to come and all of this, if they don't see it right now, they never will see it. It's more difficult, I think, for us in some ways because we have the Bible and we have it written down and we can take it with us and all these methods. They didn't have that, but instead they grew up with this. They knew what the expectations were. They were just bathed in this prophecy. And so they knew what was coming. And if they don't accept it when they see it right in front of them, hmm. he goes on to say that he is sending his sheep in the midst of wolves. So they have to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And we have seen all of this before, right? We've heard about the wolves in sheep clothing. We've seen the sheep without the shepherd. We've seen the serpents and the pits of vipers and even the doves, which first of all, represented in the Holy Spirit, but also doves as a sacrifice to the temple, gentle, unable to fight back. Watch out because these people, they're going to take you to court. They're going to flog you in the synagogue. The synagogues themselves, because they were under Roman rule, were not allowed to put people to death. They had certain punishments they were allowed to do, and flogging was really the big one. They will be dragged before governors because, again, if you're not allowed to put people to death, all you can do is drag people before governors and hope they'll put your person to death. This got dark fast, right? I'm sure the apostles 
Like one day we're like, Jesus was healing people and doing the Sermon on the Mount. And this is inspirational. And then they take that boat and the big scary storm and then that whole pig situation. And then right after that, oh, by the way, this is going to get rough for you. What just happened? We were doing so well and it was so positive. And he goes on to say, too, that you shouldn't be worried about what you're going to say because it will be given to you in that hour. I see so many people who are afraid to speak, afraid to, to say something. And what's interesting is even my best friend who witnessed to me, she does not enjoy talking about things like this. This is not her thing. But I had many people through other organizations like InterVarsity and Crew and just people who went to church try to talk to me about Jesus. And knew what to say and was prepared and their churches or their organizations helped them. But my friend, who hates talking to people, said the perfect thing for me. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. And so that is why I tell you, you don't have to be afraid. You're like your phone. The message comes through. You are the conduit of it. Don't be worried about this. And so I tell this people when I go out and speak, don't be afraid of this. He says, more scary things. Brother will deliver brother to death. The father of children will rise up against parents. Everyone will be hated. There's just going to be fighting. And if you get persecuted, you're going to have to go to the next. I mean, this is basically going to go where people will start fighting you and hating you. As disciples, they're not above their teacher or their master. And so they should be like their master. and. Brings out the point again that if they called me the devil, what are they going to do to you or the people who become converts? I guess what I always think about this is that when you become a convert and your family is not Christian, no one's that pleased about that whole situation. They think you're no longer going to be any fun, or maybe they were religious or they were anti religious. And now you're going to screw it all up. You're going you're gonna to be that person who comes over for Christmas and makes everybody miserable. When I told my father about that, he said to me, oh, I hope it doesn't change your life. I never saw him again. He never spoke to me again after I told him this. So it's not great. And I wasn't put to death and I wasn't harmed in any way, you know, physically about it. But people are. I had a friend of mine who grew up in a Catholic family and she became an atheist. And she loves telling everyone how miserable her family made her because she became an atheist. And at one point I said to her, look, I became a Christian from being an atheist and coming from an atheist family. And let me tell you, it's no great shakes that direction either. And that did not make her happy because she likes the idea that Christians are persecuting her, not that atheists would also persecute their family in the same way. So Jesus is telling them this is going to bring fights between people. But he says not to have fear again. He told us not to have fear already many times. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wasn't afraid in the boat because he has that perfect faith of God, knowing where his father is for him. And people do get afraid and we shouldn't. I get afraid too. But he tells them that what we had previously said in whispers, when we told people, don't go telling people what happened here. We said this quietly. We said this over to the side. You're going to say it in the light. You're going to say it so everyone can hear you, but don't be afraid of the people who can kill you, who the people who can physically harm you. Be more worried about the people who will separate you from your father. What he says can destroy both the, both the body and the soul in hell, not just the body. And God knows when even a sparrow falls. You know how many sparrows I have living in my gutter right now? A lot. And they have three batches of babies every year. Sparrows are plentiful, but Jesus knows about every one of them. So I can't ever get like mad at them. But he says that everyone who acknowledges me before men, I'll acknowledge in front of my father and vice versa. If you deny me, I will also deny you. Ooh. So this is time to be bold and not afraid of it. He reminds them, we just talked about families fighting. I did not come to bring peace, but the sword, because a, a son will be set against his father and a daughter against a mother and everyone, you know, cats and dogs are going to be fighting. Everyone's going to be fighting because of his message. If a person loves their family more than me and does not take up his cross 
Boy, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? He says that before we know what that means. And follow me, he's not worthy. And whoever finds his life, meaning you try to save your life in denying God, will lose it. And whoever loses their life for the sake of Jesus, for standing up for what Jesus wants, will find it. He is telling people, you know, again, that fights are going to break out. I always think of this too. It takes two to tango. You know, people love who, when they're against the Bible, they love to take these quotes out. See, Jesus brought the sword. He's just as violent as everybody else is. And I'm like, it means that people are going to bring out the sword against his people and bring out their swords against Jesus, which we'll see. Jesus is not telling people to fight other people. He is saying their reaction to you is going to be one of violence and one of fighting and one of hate. It's just unfortunate that people react that way. He says, whoever receives you, receives me. Not everything you do, that means you can't go and be some sort of a jerk and expect that people will receive you. But when you're bringing the message of Jesus to them and they accept it, they receive you, they are accepting Jesus. The one who receives the prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person, because he is righteous, will get a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of those little ones a cup of cold water, tiniest of kindness, he will by no means lose his reward. He is telling you, and I think this is an important point, because I sent you, and if they accept you and they accept what you say and they help you and show you kindness because of me, they will get their reward. But if they don't, I think the opposite is they won't. But here's the thing is I think so many people took this passage in general and would say, well, you have to accept me no matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter how I treat people. And the point was not now I am invincible from all criticism. It is saying when that righteous person comes to you and gives you a righteous message, that person will receive that righteousness. Anyway, there you go. That is Matthew 10. So when does this take place? Most of this takes place somewhere in the 29 AD realm. This is all very closely together. And it takes place in the same area. Right now, we're still in Capernaum. Jesus is going to send them out to different locations, but that's where we are right now. So who's in this chapter? We have Jesus. And this time he's talking to his disciples, his 12, not just all the disciples, not all the people who listened and wanted to follow Jesus, but instead he's just talking to the 12 people he called and telling them that he is sending them out and what to expect. But we also did hear message of God, the father and the Holy Spirit in here too. Some key ideas or chapters or concepts in this passage is, first of all, being called. You know, we talk about that now, that pastors and priests are called to their mission, that Jesus calls people to this occupation, just like he called them. The second big concept, I think, is minimalism. Don't go out there and bring a lot of stuff. Let the town, the homes take care of you, because if they accept you, they will. This is a time of hospitality. You will see hospitality as we go through the Bible mentioned many times. When did you offer me a drink of water? When did you offer me, you know, stranger hospitality was a big deal back then. And so he's saying, just go out and do that. He also says that you're going to be persecuted by the synagogue and the people out there that People are going to fight and families are going to fight and people are going to bring you between before governors and try to put you to death. I mean, we are not close to that time yet, but this happened and we will see every one of these apostles, unfortunately, killed for their faith, except for John, who was sent to the island of Patmos, where he was exiled. He was the only one who lived out this time. The other concept is that you shouldn't have fear. Because the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what to say. God is going to protect you. And in the end, it's not the person who destroys the body that matters. It's the one that destroys the soul. And if you stick with Jesus, that won't happen. The literary functions inside this chapter are the imagery of the sparrow. He knows when every sparrow falls. 
and he knows every hair that's on your head. And that's amazing. It seems bizarre that the creator of the universe will know this poor little goldfinch sitting there, but he does. And he knows you too. Boy, what does this say about the nature of God? It says that some people are going to follow Jesus and other people are not going to follow Jesus. And it is going to put them at each other's throats. They will fight. The synagogue structure will flog you. The, they'll haul you before governors. I mean, this paints a pretty dark image of people. It's unfortunate to say that it ended up being true for them. Obviously, it spread and it brought people in, the harvest. We are all benefactors of the fact that this harvest worked, but so many did not take this well. And so many of them did persecute anyone who was a Christian. Worse than put to death, the Romans did a hor horrible things all the way until Christianity swallowed the Roman Empire. But throughout history, and even to this day, Christians are persecuted for what they believe. And Jesus tells us this is what's going to happen, but not in vain, because he knows us and he knows when we fall. And we should care more about the person who kills the soul, not the body, which is the devil. What does it say about humans? Boy, we're a rough bunch, aren't we? Some of us will follow and others of us will persecute, arrest, fight, bring the sword. This does not paint a nice image of any of us. The central message of this is that the apostles are sent out and they were given the power of Jesus. Someone said, you know you're doing God's will when you're doing God's job. When you do the things that Jesus did, you know you're in the right mode. And that's what Jesus is telling them. I have given you my power to do these things. Go do them. It is a debate that whether or not anyone has these powers now. Some people feel that after the Holy Spirit and Pentecost was brought to us, that we no longer have prophets, we no longer have healers, and now we are spreading the message of God without these miracles. Other people believe the miracles are still there. So that is a debate. I'm not going to get in the middle of it. But they were given these powers to go do these miraculous things, and then they were going to be sent out again, first to the house of Israel, rescue his lost sheep there. But in time to come, it will go out further. So what does God intend us to do? He intends us to do the things he did, even if we can't heal people, even if we can't do the miracles that the apostles did, we are still called to serve each other, to give each other mercy and compassion and to tell them the word of God and not to be afraid because the Holy Spirit will give us the right words at the right moment. We should pray for that to happen. I mean, here's the thing. This Bible study is an experiment. I was going to do this Bible study for myself. But the whole question in this Bible study is, is can lay people read the word of God and figure it out? Do we have to have theological degrees to understand the Bible for the most part. There are places we're going to struggle here and there, but for the most part, can we get it? As I was working for another episode, Small Steps with God, it talked about that when you're doing a Bible study, pray each time when you're studying that the Holy Spirit will bring you the right thing, the right words, the right ideas. And I thought, gosh, that is so interesting. It's funny. I sit down in my little podcasting area and I record, now I pray, because I do want the Holy Spirit to be with me and to give me the right words. I think the end, what does God want from us? He wants us to receive him, to receive his message, and to receive his people, and to show kindness to those who do as well. So my meditation for this podcast is about how much we try to avoid hardship when we're living our Christian life. There's some people who love to pick fights and be complete jerks. They were not called to be jerks, but they are called to stand up for God in a very non-jerky way. Was Jesus a jerk? No. Kindness, meek, we should be too. Or if we're not that bold person, we should be bolder because we have the words of the Holy Spirit coming to us. So I'm going to meditate on, do I have the right mix for sharing, for boldness, but not jerkiness? My prayer is for all these wars and battles that people fight over faith of Jesus. 
how many people are persecuted for standing up. And I'm going to do a better job of praying for people as they face persecution from the faith. I have a nice life where I live in a place that does not love Christianity, and I can complain all I want about how they persecute us here, but they don't really, not like places in the world. I have to keep that in mind. And what information am I going to share? I want to share that message of the sparrows, where he knows every sparrow that falls, and he knows us, and that we should not be afraid for anyone who can harm us, but only the ones who can harm the soul. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. I still don't know if my podcast is up, but I wanted to tell you something, too, that maybe you didn't know. All my podcasts, including this one, is up on YouTube channels. I will put a link starting now in the show notes so that you can get there. Essentially, it's not me talking. I wish I had that much confidence, but I'm a little bit uh, chicken right now. But it is just the image of the podcast with an audiogram, like little wavies going up and down. But it's the podcast. And so you can watch it on YouTube. So if my site goes down someday when they're going to fix my site and the Bible and small steps.com will be live and active. But until then, you can go to YouTube. And if this site is down while it's getting moved, you'll be able to go to YouTube and also watch the podcast, what, regardless of whether my site is up or down. So if anything ever happens to my site, please know that you can go to YouTube. And the, again, the links will be in the show notes. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you coming. Please tell a friend, a Bible study. I've offered this before. If you would like me to talk to your Bible study or your church, probably over Zoom, about my story and coming to faith, I'm happy to do that. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I would love to hear from you. Thanks so much. And I appreciate your prayers. And I'm going to continue to pray for you too. Thanks for listening.